six stone jars with dirty water. That's what Jesus had to work with. And not only was it dirty water from all those who had traveled there and had washed, but symbolically it was contaminated by the impurity of all those who had washed there. In fact, if we really kind of dive into the theology of John, we can say that this water is also uh, contaminated or someone in some way contains the impurities of all those who had gone before in humanity from the very beginning, from generation after generation, all those who had turned away from God. In some way, these jars symbolically hold all of those impurities. Six half-filled stone jars, which makes it the perfect picture of humanity before the saving work of Jesus. Six, because seven is a perfect number, and humanity couldn't arrive at perfection on its own. And stone jars, because our hearts have become hardened from sin and resistance to God. So, not accidentally, it's at this wedding feast where Jesus meets his bride, symbolically represented by these six half-filled earthen vessels, that he has come not only to purify, but to make something more. It's interesting because Jesus doesn't say, you know, dump out the old water, dump out that nasty water and fill it with something else. He doesn't say, get some other containers and fill those with water. But he says, fill it to the brim, fill it up, fill up what's, what's already in there, fill up to the top what is already in there, which is a sign that Jesus hasn't come to, uh, to destroy what was there before, to start all over again. But he's come to enter into the mess with us. He's come to enter into that nastiness, the, the, the brokenness, the sinfulness that we've so often fallen into. He's come to, to enter into that and to transform that into something beautiful, something sweet, something that we can use to share life and joy with others. And this is an important message for us because I think sometimes we can feel like we've made a mess of our souls and that we've somehow uh, tainted the gift of grace that was poured into our hearts at baptism. Maybe those waters have become so uh, muddied and stagnant that we feel like there's no way to navigate them, that we can't, we can't reach God because of the, of the filth that is present in those waters. But this gospel gives us great hope because Jesus can take even the nastiest water full of impurity, full of filth and poor decisions and misguided desires and he can generate something new and sweet not only for us but for others. And this is the, the new humanity. I think that the world needs today water turned to wine that can be shared, that can be poured out for the sake of others, that brings refreshment to all those who encounter us. You know, one of the things that I, I wish I could share with you uh, on a regular basis are things that I, stories that I hear in confession that don't worry I'm not. Uh, uh, but there are, there are moments I wish that I could, I could share with you these things because something beautiful happens there. When people have the willingness to come in and identify their brokenness and to, to freely hand it over to God, I can't tell you the joy that people experience. I mean, I hope, I hope that you've had this experience for yourself and reconciliation, if not, the times are listed in the bulletin. Uh, but we need this moment, this moment when we can be made new, when we can be restored, when, when our dignity can be salvaged from the wreck that we have 
uh, created because of our own sinfulness. Confession is the privileged place that the church offers us so that we can have that experience. But it's not the only place. Because I suspect that all of us in our lives can recognize at least one person whose dignity has been trampled on, who's felt beaten down, who's, who's made mistakes, who's, who's had bad relationships and, and all kinds of things. I think we can all identify someone who could use this uh, restoration, this being lifted up and, and, and brought to life again. And we have to reach out to these people, not out of a sense of duty or obligation because the priest said we had to, but because they share our humanity, because they share our experience of, of struggling with temptation, of, of celebrating joy, of, of wrestling with this, this gift of our humanity that's been given to us. This is something that, that unites us as one people. This is something that we share together. This humanity, this struggle with humanity, this need to be made new. You know, we've been talking a lot in the various councils that, that help to guide our, our work of our parish about being a, a parish of unity. What does it mean to be a unified parish? And I've been asking myself this question a lot because, you know, you try to plan ahead, what can we do to make our parish more unified? And I keep thinking, well, what, what does that even mean? Does it mean that we all go to Mass at the same time, in the same place? Does it mean that all of our kids go to school at the same campus? Does it mean that we have to shut one place down so that we can all be together? I don't think so. I don't think this is the kind of unity that we're looking for, because, I mean, let's be honest, we could all go to Mass at the same time, in the same place. Our kids could all go to school in the same place and, and sit through the same classes, and we can still hate the person who's sitting next to us. We need a greater unity, something that goes beyond being in the same place at the same time. We need something that brings us together, that helps us to adopt a common mission, that helps us to follow someone who is leading us to a better place. What we need is to belong to the person of Christ. There is no other source of unity than that. There is nothing else that we can do if we skip that point of being united to the person of Christ. And that means that we all have to do it. It's not enough that our parish council commits to being united to the person of Christ, or the finance council, or the school council, or the pastor. It doesn't matter. All of us have to belong to Him. All of us have to want Him. We have to, to want to be in love with Him. We have to want to draw near to Him. We have to want Him involved in every aspect of our lives. We have to want Him to lead us and to guide us and to give us hope and strength. We have to want Christ. We have to want Him to come in and transform ugliness and bitterness and division and sin into something beautiful, something tasty that can be shared with others. We need Him. We have to belong to Him. Because only He can bring the unity that we need. We heard about it in our second reading. St. Paul tells us that we've all been gifted. God has blessed all of us with a particular charism that we can share. But it's not for us to keep. If you're blessed with the gift of healing, you can't stand in the mirror and try to keep yourself alive. We have to share the gift of healing. If God has given you the gift of prophecy, don't line up your, uh, your stuffed animals and preach to them. Go tell people who need to hear the word of God. We have to go out. We have to go out in order to appreciate what God has given to us. And in this way, God not only brings unity to a people, but He also restores our dignity. 
because we can recognize that we all, we all have a part to play, a role that God has chosen just for us. Friends, Christ wants nothing more than to restore our dignity and to help us to belong to Him and to one another. No matter what you've done, no matter, no matter what evil you may have committed, no matter how many times you've fallen away, no matter how many times you've resisted change or spoken badly of others, Christ can transform it all into something sweet, something that brings life and joy. Here at this great wedding feast of the Eucharist, Let's welcome the one who has come to make us whole. And let's share what we have been given with those that God has placed in our lives.